everyone. Welcome back to ESG Decoded. I'm your host, Caitlin Allen, and uh, today I'm welcoming two awesome people to the podcast. Uh, first, we have Jonah Wagner, who's the chief strategist for the U.S. government's Department of Energy Loan Programs Office. We're going to be learning a lot more about what they do shortly. Um, and we also have uh, from Mighty Mitt Climco, uh, David Prieto, who's our senior director for climate and energy advisory. David, Jonah, thank you so much for being here. So great Our to pleasure. Be here. And we will get, I know listeners are used to having the bio right up front. We're going to get a little bit more into background um, later in the conversation, but we thought it would be helpful to start out um, having Jonah explain a little bit more about the mandate of the DOE's Loan Programs Office. And for our international listeners, I'll say um, the acronyms once. So the Depart U.S. Department of Energy. Um, of the U.S. government is DOE, and then our loan programs office is LPO. So you're free to use acronyms from now on, Jonah. <laughs> oh, there's a lot more acronyms coming. <laughs> um, good to know. I'll do my best. Um, yeah, so, so great to be here. Um, I guess at the highest level, the loan programs office finances clean energy and decarbonization of projects here in the United States. Um, to your question around mandates, we have three core mandates that map to our authorities under statute. Um, the first is we act as a bridge to bankability for emerging clean energy and decarbonization technologies um, so that they can access low cost, non-dilutive capital that they would be challenged to get from commercial lenders. Um, the second is we enable the expansion of domestic manufacturing and supply chains to support a cleaner and stronger American energy economy. And I think a good example of this is our recent loan to Ford for the construction of three battery manufacturing facilities in Tennessee and Kentucky. And third, uh, we make the energy, the clean energy transformation affordable and achievable for workers, consumers, and communities who stand to benefit from our support. Um, and uh, I guess an, uh, uh, an example coming out of the IRA or Inflation Reduction Act is our new energy infrastructure reinvestment program, which focuses on crowding in investment to replace defunct fossil energy assets with new energy infrastructure, which can create good jobs and shore up the, Ameri uh, the, uh, the tax base in those same communities. Um, all of our authorities require broadly that projects are located in the United States, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and have a reasonable prospect of repayment because they are all loans. Um, and as of July of this year, we have 157 applications that are actively seeking close to $140 billion in loan proceeds, which is the equivalent of about a quarter of a trillion dollars of domestic clean energy and decarbonization projects and we're averaging about 1.5 new applications per week. Wow, that's incredible. Um, I want to just pass it to David um, for a couple of questions, and then um, we'll get back to your background. Wonderful, thanks, Caitlin. Super exciting to have you on the podcast. Thanks, Jonah. You mentioned the, the concept of bridge to bankability. Uh, could you help us ex understand a bit more of that concept and how LPO fits into the capital stack of a company who might be looking at implementing various decarbonization levers? That's a great question. Um, so if we zoom out all the way, the Department of Energy thinks about technology com commercialization along a continuum. Um, we call this framework the RDD&D continuum, which stands for Research, Development, Demonstration, and Deployment. And LPO is in that last bucket, the last D, deployment. Um, and that, at that's the stage at which the technology really needs to work. So for your listeners who are familiar with the TRL scale, tech readiness level seven and above is typically where we play. Um, the concept of a bridge to bankability or crossing the bridge to bankability, like if you think about many emerging clean energy technologies can't access traditional commercial debt from traditional lenders in the private market, um, or tap into public equity markets or access institutional infrastructure investment. Um, they're viewed as too new, too risky. The profile of the deals, if you think about it, these are projects that have a lot of CapEx investment and then very predictable, steady cash flows if they work. So it's 
like these are not investments in enterprise software, right? You're not going to get like a hockey stick growth on like a very low budget. Uh, that's extremely sticky, right? These are investors who are effectively taking equity like risk, but getting bond like returns. And that's a tough sell for technologies that are commercially unproven and have real competition from incumbent technologies in the market. And so LPO's job is to take those risks where the private market won't yet. Um, and we help technologies move along what we think of as four major milestones on the bridge to bankability. So the first is first of a kind deployment, like the first time you do the thing, which is basically overcoming the applied engineering challenges of taking the thing out of a demonstration and into a real commercial um, application. The next milestone is the sec call it second through fifth deployment, and that's about managing down construction risks. So can you repeat the thing that you did the first time and get better at it? The third milestone we think of as the learning curve, which is basically the, as you increase the manufacturing base of the technology, you get predictable unit cost declines, just like we saw in solar and wind, and now we're seeing in EVs and EV batteries that create demand. And all of a sudden the technologies themselves can can compete. Um, and then the last milestone is we think of as commercial market education. So this is the reality is that until banks and commercial lenders get comfortable with the technology, um, they're, they're apt to sit on the, the sidelines um, because when it comes to lending, you actually need quite a bit of volume to want to get out of bed, right? And so uh, educating these, these commercial debt markets and bringing them into our deals earlier is a priority that we have. Um, from a capital stack standpoint specifically, um, just very simply, our debt plays very well with other debt, with commercial debt. We can guarantee private debt. We can direct loan from the Federal Finance Bank of the Treasury. We play very well with tax credits. So all of the tax credits associated with the IRA are going to work very well with our program and strengthen the prospect of repayment for those, pro for those uh, loans. Um, we do not play well, generally speaking, with grants and financial assistance from the government. Um, generally speaking, um, we are restricted, uh, applicants are restricted from paying back a federal loan with, a, with federal money. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Makes sense. I, I love the, the concept of equity type risk and bond type returns. That's the first for me. And it, if I were to summarize, it does sound that there is fundamentally a stamp of approval from a technological and commercial aspect to then get to that commercial deployment after uh, an asset and an applicant goes through your office. That's, I mean, you've, you've put your finger on the heart of it. What um, Jigger Shaw, the director of the office will often say is, yes, people, less, yes, applicants come to us for financing, but they also come to us for that stamp of approval that they got through the DOE process, which is not easy. And, um, and then they can hold that up to potential other sources of equity, or they can hold that up to potential off takers or what have you as, a, as proof um, that this is a real business. Jonah, I'd like to take a step back um, to learn a little bit more about you for a moment. Um, so tell us a little bit about what brought you to the LPO in the first place and how's it been since you joined? Certainly. Um, I feel incredibly lucky um, to be working in this administration under this secretary, who's extraordinary, and for with Jigger Shaw as the director of our office. Um, I heard like my own views informed by obviously everything we're all reading um, is that we have about 10 to 15 years to bend the curve on the pace of transforming our energy system to avert the worst effects of climate change. And DOE and LPO are right at the heart of this transformation. Um, so I feel very lucky. My own path to LPO is pretty circuitous. Um, I studied environmental policy as an undergrad. I've always been joined, uh, drawn to public service. Um, I was a consultant with McKinsey and Company for a number of years and helped to stand up our customer experience and government practice, which was primarily focused on building trust between institutions and the businesses and communities and individuals they serve. 
Um, I had a number of different stints working on infrastructure around the world and across sectors. So I led strategy and business development for a company in Western India called uh, Piramal Water, um, which stood up distributed infrastructure for water purification systems along you know, in a handful of states on the West Coast. Um, I spent a year as a senior analyst at the New Zealand Treasury, uh, working on infrastructure and environmental policy uh, and the application of advanced analytics to informing public infrastructure management. Um, and just prior to LPO, I uh, worked at Delterra, which is uh, formerly McKinsey.org, um, as the regional director of Latin America and the global head of strategy. Um, and the focus of that organization, it's an extraordinary organization, is um, applying market mechanisms to create sustainable recycling systems in uh, municipalities around the world. Um, but during COVID, I decided to shift my career uh, to work fully on climate change. Um, and I was introduced to Jigger as someone who could offer me advice on how to navigate this transition. And I remember um, getting on the phone with Jigger and sort of sharing a couple of the offers that I was considering and like, should I do this or should I do this? And the next thing I knew I was starting at LPO. Um, and I guess for your listeners who know Jigger, uh, your listeners who know Jigger will not be surprised at all by that story. Um, and it's been an extraordinary run so far. Thank you so much. That was a super interesting background. I love the story. A lot of um, the best moves in our life happen very spontaneously like that and unplanned for sure. Um, but let's, you know, speaking to our audience, our, our corporate audience um, in the moment, um, David, help me make that link for them. For clients sitting around thinking, how do I participate? Or, you know, what what would you tell them, David? Definitely, Caitlin. Um, my hope is that maybe in two years' time, we don't have to make this link anymore. Um, in the same way, Jonah has been very fortunate about working in this administration and with a leader like Jigger Shaw, I feel the same way at Climco. We have leaders that have been in the carbon market space for during its booms and busts. And now that decarbonization is front and center, both in industrial policy and on corporate commitments, um, we have clients that are asking about uh, the difficult questions of decarbonization. I think the link for us are, are a handful. Uh, we have a primary focus on companies that are want to be climate leaders and want to do their um, pinch of effort when it comes to the, the climate change crisis and the Paris Agreement. In that sense, uh, a lot of our client base are industrial players, where we can call them at times hard to players in the hard to abate sector. That is cement, aviation, petrochemicals. So in the journey to getting to that 1.5 degrees pathway and net zero by 2050, uh, we do know many of the solutions that are out there. Uh, common ones are resource productivity and electrification of energy and of transportation. However, these hard to abate sectors have it significantly harder, um, hence the name. So I do think that is where Jonah's team comes in. Uh, at times when there is technological um, interventions that these companies might have access to but aren't yet commercial, a partner like the LPO can come in, vet them with experts at the DOE and provide that initial funding to help deploy that commercial um, intervention to help achieve their targets. Uh, what does that entail? Therefore, it's a, when you talk about climate risk and opportunity, it's managing that climate risk, which means helping companies reduce their emissions on an annual basis. And definitely it is also um, harnessing climate opportunity because you're creating a competitive advantage by having ideally a product or service that has a lower greenhouse gas intensity as a result of those new assets that they've helped deploy with the LPO. Easier said, easier said than done, but definitely that I would say is the key overlap between uh, the LPO and some of our clients here at Climco. Yeah, that makes sense. And, you know, David, you noted our focus on the hard to abate sectors, cement, petrochem, that sort of thing. So maybe back to you, Jonah, what types of programs might be um, most suited for companies uh, that are looking at large scale decarbonization interventions um, in these more hard to abate sectors? Yeah, that's a it's a great question. Look, this is hard to abate. No, this is hard. Um, for our own programs at the Loan Programs Office, um, the, the authorities that are most directly relevant are our Title 17 Innovative Energy and Supply Chain um, authorities um, that can 
basically that program specifically is designed around financing uh, decarbonization projects that are innovative. Um, and that could apply here uh, specifically. Um, the reality is that in our current pipeline, we only have a handful of applications that fit this category. Um, these are projects that are trying novel approaches to utilizing carbon in the production of cement and aggregates um, and the use of bio-based feedstocks and carbon capture for chemicals. Um, but these are tough. The economics are tough. And um, the IRA, and in particular uh, 45Q, will have an impact, um, but that impact is still sort of moving through the pipe. Um, and to that effect, I know we'll talk more about this maybe later, but we, the Loan Programs Office together, working across the Office of the Undersecretary for Infrastructure, has been working on a series of what we've been calling Pathways to Commercial Liftoff, um, focused on specific technologies and sectors that we need to see capital formation and deployment around if we're gonna have any hope of achieving our uh, decarbonization goals. And um, the next batch of those is all about industrial decarbonization um, for that reason. And then one other side note, um, the bipartisan infrastructure law uh, specifically allocated $6 billion for industrial decarbonization emissions reduction, demonstration and deployment um, projects. Um, that funding opportunity announcement is live until I think tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, if you were not aware of it, uh, it's probably a little too late. Um, but we're going to learn a lot, I expect, from the applications that are and the awards that are made through that program, um, because uh, we're going to really see where the industry has momentum and what type of additionality we need to see um, in order to move the ball forward. And you mentioned the liftoff. Um, so I just want to highlight for our listeners the liftoff reports. Um, are available, and we can include that link in the resources to the episode. You can Google also, if you're really excited about it, don't have time, you can go Google right now, liftoff reports, DOE, um, and and take a look at some of those um, really, really interesting reports. And I know there's more coming, so um, that will that will be in the episode um, links. Um, let's, let's talk a little bit more about IRA. So I know, you know, DOE LPO has existed before that existed before the IRA, Correct. but the IRA Inflation Reduction Act, again, um, passed by Congress last year, um, huge piece of legislation. How has the LPO changed since that? So both the IRA and the bipartisan infrastructure law impacted our office meaningfully um, in increasing and broadening our authorities. Um, so our loan authorities specifically through the IRA increased from in aggregate about $40 billion to closer to $400 billion, so tenfold increase. Um, for our existing programs, um, 1703, our tribal loan program, our ATVM program, all increased. For our ATVM program, so that's Advanced Technology Vehicles Manufacturing Program, um, uh, that program is designed to support uh, or to finance uh, component inputs into low emissions vehicles, vehicle manufacturing. Um, and that, that program was specifically focused on light duty and passenger vehicles prior to the bipartisan infrastructure law passing. Now it covers medium and heavy duty vehicles. It covers maritime. It covers uh, air travel, so component inputs into air uh, transport. It covers hyperloops, if any of your listeners are looking to finance one of those. Um, and uh, we also have a new CIFIA program, which we manage jointly with the Fossil Energy and Carbon Management Office. This is specifically designed around to support CO2 transportation pipelines and, and uh, trucks. And then I think our most important new authority I mentioned earlier is the Energy Infrastructure Reinvestment Program. That's Title 1706. And this program supports reinvestment, replacement of energy infrastructure that has ceased to operate with something uh, with new energy infrastructure or 
the decarbonization of existing operating energy infrastructure. And this is a $250 billion lending authority that sunsets in September 30, 2026. So we have our work cut out for us. Um, and then just to add, you know, to support all of this, um, I think our team has more than doubled in the last 12 to 18 months. Um, and we're still growing uh, just the, to meet the, the level of responsibility that, that Congress has given us. Yeah, incredible. Thank you for sharing that. Um, okay, so let's pivot to actually doing deals. So how does a deal get done? Um, all of those different pieces. Um, David, do you want to kick us off with a question? Uh, definitely. So one of the mandates Jonah you described was that apart from being in the United States, there has to be a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions in, of these assets mm -hmm. over their lifetime. So, so what's the process of defining that? Uh, do you conduct a life cycle assessment? Uh, is it the DOE doing it, the IRS, uh, the LPOs program? So could you shed a bit of light into the, let's say, the quantification of emissions? and its impact yeah. into these investments? Yeah, no, I mean, you have it exactly right. So we do a greenhouse gas life cycle assessment. It's cradle to grave. We look at, and when I say we, like DOE does the assessment. We, from, you know, raw material extraction, transport, energy inputs into the facility, the applicant's facility or project and activities associated with it, the transportation and distribution of the product, the end use and end of life of the product, all that's wrapped in. We use industry accepted ISOs principles, ISO principles. Um, and the way it works is the applicant provides the data and we do the assessment. And all of the forms and details can be found in our this new Title 17 guidance that we published earlier this year. And I, I wonder, Caitlin, if we can link that as well. Because um, that that's the that's the best new thing we've sort of done to clarify how our how our Title 17 lending programs work. It's a um, it lays it all out very clearly. So, so just just to double down on on one point, there is if we clients do provide the data, applicants provide the data. So Correct. with forty five Q, there is the NETL guidance on defining how do you account for the um, greenhouse gas impact. So does that mean that with these applications, the the tool is is it's not public? The tool that the DOE uses. Uh, our, an applicant wouldn't have access to that tool to then see if it would pass the first due diligence process, like for forty-five Q. Rather for or, for your process. Um, mm -hmm. um, in general, this is a part of the process that we do ourselves. Um, there may be instances I've heard of instances of applicants doing their own outside-in assessment. Um, but once they're in the process, um, typically we do an initial screen during the part one, the initial application that they put in, and to get a general sense of whether we think this will have a substantial reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and for many projects, it's not really on the margin. There are some that are on the margin, and in those cases, um, the best thing to do is for us to run it, yeah. right? Because we're going to be the the sort of source of truth as to whether or not they qualify in any case. Are the tools, I would assume, do they have, are they usually more like tailored to the asset? They're not like cookie cutter um, throughout the due diligence process. Cause in our experience, when we do support with 45Q applications, they're very bespoke. They're seldom cookie cutter based on the, you know, the asset that we're trying to um, represent. So I don't know if you can, maybe you can't elaborate on that, but based on the uniqueness of these investments, I would assume that it requires, it's pretty tailored for application. So we partner with National Lab, at least one National Lab in conducting these life cycle assessments. I think in many cases, these are the same authorities who weigh in publicly on how to do LCAs writ large for industry as well. And so I, I don't know the specifics of how those analyses are run, but I can tell you that um, I assume that they're done in a way that you're getting to apples to apples on the quantified greenhouse gas emissions reduction expectancy. But yes, they are different. Obviously, each each technology is a, uh, moving, uh, you know, operates in a different way. Uh, molecules are different than electrons, yeah. et cetera. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. 
Cool. Are there any other ESG issues integrated into your due diligence process? Yes. Um, so one of the areas, and this is an area we're quite proud of, is uh, our uh, inclusion of community benefits plans and community benefits planning processes um, into our work with our applicants. Every applicant is required to put together a community benefits plan in order to qualify for a loan. Um, these plans uh, are designed to support com meaningful community and labor engagement, to ensure investment in America's workforce, to advance diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility priorities, and then to contribute broadly to the president's goal um, that 40% of overall benefits of clean energy investment flow to disadvantaged communities. So this is otherwise known as the Justice 40 initiative. And when LPO thinks about these things, because David, to your point around Climco, we are a risk management organization fundamentally. Um, we think of these as good business practices. Uh, and what we often find is that our applicants are doing a lot of these things anyway. They just don't know what to call them, you know, and our coaching of them and working with them is to, to think about more holistically how to do right by the communities they're operating in so they have social license to continue to operate there. Um, and I, maybe I can give one example of this. Um, so the, the Ford and Blue Oval SK project that I uh, mentioned earlier, um, this was the recent $9.2 billion conditional commitment we made um, for those three manufacturing facilities in Tennessee and Kentucky, which is, by the way, the single largest loan we have made or commitment we've made in our history. Um, for that project, you know, Ford partnered with the state governments of both states to develop curricula for new technical schools that could be used to train members of the community for jobs in those facilities. Um, and all of the manufacturing facilities are either based in or adjacent to uh, disadvantaged communities. So that this idea of creating good jobs and strengthening the local tax base is integral um, to these programs. That's really cool. Yeah, thanks for sharing that example too. I think it really makes it concrete for people. This is this is actually having and intended to have very concrete benefits right here in the US. Yes. So very cool example. Um could you um okay, let me let me back up. Let's start with um conditional commitments. Yes. So the LPO has announced various conditional commitments. How does that differ from a loan? Well, you need to get a conditional commitment on your way to a loan. Um, so a conditional commitment is basically saying, we will give you a loan provided you meet a set of conditions precedent that we write into the terms of the conditional commitment. And those conditions precedent um, could be anything, right? They could be financial, right? You need to go raise the rest of the equity for the deal. They could be technical. Um, they could be permitting or completion of a NEPA review. Um, they could be completing your community benefits plan. That could be a condition precedent before you receive a loan. Um, and many of these are elements that the applicant would need to solve anyway before they could move out on the project with or without us, right? Like you, you need the equity to show up and you need offtake agreements to, in place if you're actually going to move out. Um, and what we found is that the conditional commitment itself can accelerate that process. So if you receive a conditional commitment that says, once I do these things, I get you know, a substantial portion of my financing solved by the federal government, um, it's a little bit of a different conversation when you go to an investor and say, all we need is you to sign on the dotted line and we're in business. Um, and so that's part of this process of creating credibility for the project, LPO putting its stamp on it, and then being able to go to the market to speed it up. So as you mentioned, we do have several applications at that stage. So Monolith Materials, Redwood Materials, Lifecycle, Hestia, and we are optimistic that those projects will move to close. Excellent. Yeah, thanks for those examples. Um, so another, another big buzzy topic is carbon management, right? So the LPO has yet to announce deals related to carbon management. Could you share a sneak peek of what's in the pipeline for next year? I cannot. Um, 
So one note for your listeners is uh, we the loan programs office is subject to the Trade Secrets Act, which means that our entire uh, pipeline and portfolio uh, prior to conditional commitment is uh, is business confidential um, under law. And so we do not talk publicly about our applicants uh, until there's a public announcement uh, to make. Um, however, I will flag that our monthly application activity report, which we publish online on our website, um, you can see that by the, the shapes of the boxes on the page, um, that we have several billion dollars worth of applications in this space. Um, and those projects cover the full spectrum of carbon management projects. So we have you know, carbon capture at power plants and industrial facilities. Um, we have CO2 pipeline projects that have been proposed. We have direct air capture projects that have been proposed. So we have a lot of, there's a lot of momentum in that space. Um, I just, I hope that we'll be able to speak more publicly about some of these soon. You know, I think it's great, though, that you highlight that because it might stop some companies from applying if they think, oh, gosh, you know, my trade secret will be publicized on my application. But knowing that you all are subject to the Trade Secrets Act, you know, gives companies that confidence that they they can apply, they can share their technology with the DOE and have it um, have it protected. So that's really cool. I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. I, and I think that to our listeners is a big message for them to know. Um, that confidentiality. Uh, Jonah, one one of the messages I'm hearing in our conversation is it is an onerous process to apply to the DOE. Um, so for those companies who haven't yet started the process but are interested in starting it, it might be a daunting task. What would you tell them of progress you've made, updates that perhaps have been announced that might reduce the burden on, on an applicant to, to start this important process with LPO? So the first thing I would tell them is it is a daunting task. Um, and that's by design. I mean, this is a loan we want to get paid back. Our track record shows that we've been, our diligence has paid off. You know, we've only had about a 3% loss rate over the life of our portfolio to date, um, which we would hold up against a commercial bank lending in, in, into similar risky projects. So. Um, but what I will say is that uh, we have tried to make this process as open and transparent as possible. Um, we have waived upfront application fees. Um, we've split the Title 17 application process into a part one and a part two, so we can determine initial eligibility um, before you, an applicant does all the work, uh, before they would enter into due diligence, just so that we can do that initial screening. Um, our goal is to um, get is always to get to yes or to get to no as fast as possible um, so that we make sure that if we're continuing to embark through the due diligence process that we're doing it with a full expectation of a conditional commitment and a close. Um, as I mentioned, we've published guidance for Title 17 programs, which collapsed multiple different previous solicitations into one clean, uh, easy to follow process as, as best we can. And I think perhaps the most important change we've made is we've hired a team, an outreach and business development team of about 40 people now um, and growing. And many of these folks are former CEOs, former fund manager, managers, former developers, folks who've spent a lot of time in the space in the private sector and really understand the entrepreneurial or industry side of the, the picture. And, um, and they are effectively coaches and advisors to the applicants moving through the process. So they bring them in, they help them write their first, like the part one application, give them feedback, and then they provide that account management support through the life of the loan until it closes. And so, and they are standing by to take calls and we will take a call with, with anyone who's seeking, uh, who, who is looking for, for debt that, uh, that we could support. That's incredible. What a, Wonderful resource. I didn't know that. Very cool. Um, well, Jonah and David, thank you both for your time. Jonah, we're so grateful that you spent some time with us to share and get the word out about this incredible opportunity for, for companies um, working on, on these issues. So um, 
I want to give you the last word, Jonah. Is there anything else you would like to share? Um, any other resources? Anything else you'd like to, to say before we close out today? Yeah, I guess I'd just give one more plug for these liftoff reports. Um, okay. To be clear, uh, we're not going to hit any of our goals um, unless the private sector shows up and leads. And, and that's whether it's energy security and affordability, supply chain resiliency and competitiveness, creating high quality jobs, or decarbonization. Um, and uh, it's going to take hundreds of billions of dollars of private sector investment in each of the technologies that David mentioned in the hard to decarbonize sector that you're focused on. Um, and the goal of these liftoff report, reports is intended, we developed them with through extensive consultation with the private sector and others to create a common fact base that can be used to define what is the path to commercial liftoff. And um, as I mentioned, the first four are live, nuclear, hydrogen, long duration energy storage, and carbon management. They're all excellent. Um, and the next wave will be industrial decarbonization and virtual power plants. And those are coming out in a month. So um, please stay tuned for that. I think a lot of our awesome. audience are going to be very excited for those reports. And I'll say for our audience who are looking to support, like you said, Jonah, uh, your, your team is growing a lot. So I'm sure there's opportunities for anyone with any background to support the LPO. So the shout out also to those in our audience that currently aren't working with our clients, but are, would be interested in supporting the important mission of the LPO. Send them our way. Thank you so much, Jenna. Appreciate you. your time.